Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Welcome to Financial Empowerment, Take Charge of Your Financial Future, hosted by the Smith Business Network Board. Um, I will introduce myself briefly. My name is Sandy Kim Suk. I am a Smith grad and one of the board members of the Smith Business Network. For those of you who don't know, the Smith Business Network is a network of 53,000 Smith graduates activated around a central goal of furthering professional and career aspirations within our community. Smithy is interested in engaging around professional and career related content, are encouraged to participate in the Smith Business Network and go speak to Christy afterwards. Um, <laughs> there you go. Um, a little bit of a background on myself. I am a mother of three daughters and the CFO of Engine Number no. One, an investment firm which identifies and pursues value creation opportunities and once in a at one in once in a generation economic sector transitions with the goal of driving long term performance. Simply said, we like to make money, but that's okay. That's a good thing, right? <laughs> um, I have the pleasure of introducing an amazing panel of Smith graduates for this evening's program. But before I do, I want to do a special call out to a few people. Special thanks to Alliance Bernstein and Lisa for allowing us to use this beautiful space. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Christy, Kennedy, and Smith for helping us, you know, catalyze ourselves to get organized and actually have this event. Mm -hmm. Thank That's you. Fabulous. And then a special call out to Barbara Taylor, because as we all know, without Barbara Taylor, there would be no Smith Business Network. <laughs> yeah. Before I introduce our panel, a bit about what we hope you will achieve uh, from tonight's event. We want you to leave this event feeling empowered to understand and manage your financial future and knowing you are not alone and feeling lost when it comes to financial planning. Our experts tonight will share tips and tricks and we'll have time for questions afterwards. As a personal side, I have been in finance my entire career and I learned way too late the value of a financial advisor. I was of the mindset and I'm a finance professional, I can do this. <laughs> I was wrong. Famous last words. Yeah, I was, way, I was wrong. What I did not realize is that with a full-time job and raising a family, managing your own personal finances takes a lot of time to do well. I am starting my girls early. I am that mother which texts in the family group chat, max out your 401k. <laughs> Think about where you should make your next investment. Um, Kanita, you know, my girls may be calling you soon. <laughs> um, secondly, we want you to connect with your New York City Smith network. It's a powerful source of knowledge, information, and support. This is our network here. So embrace it, connect with each other. There are little cards around the room where we are. Smith is, you know, has technology. There's an app for that, right, where you can... Can you swipe left or swipe right or something? Yeah. Not yet, but, <laughs> but you can actually connect with each other on this app. So that is, Christy will talk about that later on in the program. Um, now I have the honor of introducing you to our speakers for this evening. Um, moderator and board member, Gitanjali Falero. Off. <laughs> Gitanjali joined Greenhill in 2019 as a managing director, general counsel, and corporate sec secretary. Her portfolio of responsibilities includes transactional advice, governance, data privacy, cybersecurity, employment law, and publicly listed company matters. She is based in New York. Previously, Gitanjali worked at Goldman Sachs, Latham and Watkins, and Linklaters. I'm People, if you want to know about that, go speak to Gitanjali <laughs> after, the, after the panel. Gitanjali graduated from Smith College in 2000. As a proud member of Wilder House, she holds a <laughs> law degree from Oxford and is admitted to both the UK and New York bars. On a personal note, I met Gitanjali um, in person last October at our board meeting, and she kept the New York team together and organized, and this is the first event of the Smith Business Network. So, Tanjali, wow. thank you. Thank you, Tanjali. Um, our next panelist is Kanita Bullock. Um, Kanita has a lot of acronyms. 
after her name, so she's super, super smart. And of course, she went to Smith. Um, she is the CEO of Master Plan Investment Group, which is based in Pennington, New Jersey. And she is an award winning multi generational wealth manager and employer retirement plan advisor committed to enriching the lives of her clients and their legacy. Um, Kanina started a master plan investment group in 2019 with the mission to serve clients by helping them clarify their financial goals, chart a course for success, and live a fulfilled life. Um, yeah, right? <laughs> in 2006, Kanina graduated from Smith with a bachelor's degree in government. Um, after college, she completed a Fulbright fellowship in South Korea where she studied economics and taught English at a girls middle school. After returning from Korea, Kanita began her career in the investment management industry with one of the largest investment firms in the nation called Capital Group. And from there, she had various careers and finally launched um, Master Plan Investment Group. Kanita became a certified financial planner in April of 2020. Currently, there are only 3.7% of CFP, CFP professionals who are Black or Latino, and only 23.3% are women. And Kanina is committed to improving those statistics, those statistics. And we should help support her, by the way, in that. So, okay. As a wife of 10 plus years, a mother of two girls, Bella and Madison Beautiful. Uh, she spends most of her time outside of the office with her family, enjoying time with friends, family, and serving her communities. And Kanita has promised to help my daughter, so that's also another <laughs> boss. <laughs> and finally, we have panelist and board member Lisa Stone. Woo, Lisa. <laughs> Lisa Stone is a principal and financial advisor in the Senior Investment Advisor Group in Bernstein's New York office. She works with high net worth individuals and families, trusts, estates, foundations, and pensions, thoughtfully guiding each client and developing a long-term investment plan in light, in light of their objectives. Lisa is also expert in advising on the issues associated with concentrated stock positions and strategies to maximize after-tax returns. So for those tech you know, tech startups out there, go speak to Lisa. Um, Lisa received her BA from Smith College, graduating magna cum laude. She holds board positions with the Armory Track and Field Foundation, the, Rockefell the Rockefeller University Committee on Trust and Estates Gift Plans, and of course, the Smith College Business Network. Yeah. She is an avid runner and has successfully completed 41 full marathons and five 50-mile ultra marathons. Lisa lives in Manhattan and has two adult ch children. So I also met Lisa um, at the Smith Business Network, and I actually drove Lisa to and from Northampton because I learned. They do my, a lot, but she doesn't drive. Yeah, uh, Lisa dri learned how to drive later on in life. <laughs> I was like, oh, interesting. Rapidly okay. gave it up. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's how we got to know each other. The other thing I learned about Lisa is she truly is an avid runner. She would go out and I'm like, it's cold outside. She's like, nope, this is good. I'm out there. And she put the rest of us to shame, but that's okay. It's fine. Um, and then Lisa also has remar a remarkable boot collection. So the entire weekend, I was like, oh, where did you get those boots? Um, <laughs> And of course, we can say that in this room. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it, it's all good. So Lisa has an incredible skill with knowing how to connect with people, which is another example of great leadership. And I am excited and honored to have gotten to know her at a personal level. And had I met her earlier, I might be more financially secure. <laughs> and now with that, we will start the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you everyone for being here with us. Um, quick 30 seconds on how this even came about after the Smith Business Network met in October. Um, I connected with these fabulous women and- um, She took charge. Well, <laughs> even before I took charge, somewhere between the Smith event and coming up with this idea with Lisa, I had to go home to India to take care of my aging parents and take care of a particular matter. And the course of that turned to my mother, who is a highly educated woman, 
to say, well, you know, we should probably make a list of all the bank accounts and figure out where everything is and make sure I have the passwords, et cetera. She said, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, what do you mean you don't know what I'm talking about? And so she said, you have to talk to your dad. And so we sat down with dad and dad gave me a whole list of everything and all his instructions. And I was telling my husband on a trans world call that, oh, you know, we did this. Lovely, well done, good daughter. <laughs> and he said, so when are you gonna do it? And I was like, uh, <laughs> uh, he said, you know, you might be general counsel and all that, but I got your money. <laughs> and it is true. It is true. Embarrassingly, it is true. Um, I had, until very recently, no idea of really where my check was going. I know I'd given some information to my HR director at the beginning of my stint. I knew I was compensated in RSUs, that I had a vesting schedule that I was supposed to keep track of. I handed all that information over to my husband and said, that's what you do. I do everything else, but you do travel and finances. <laughs> and I realized through that process how vulnerable I felt and how vulnerable I had put myself into. So this is a Smith grad who had been told by Professor Manaz Madavi, be sensible, <laughs> you studied econ. Um, this is someone who had been at Goldman Sachs. I mean, come on, the vampire squid. Uh, someone who was, you know, who, ha who to this day still advises on multi-billion dollar transactions yet can't keep track of her own wealth. And that gave rise to this conversation that I had with Lisa once I realized what Lisa was doing. And I said, you know, I am so embarrassed by this. And she said, you don't need to be. Many of us are in this situation. So lo and behold, this whole conversation is really to get us all thinking about that, to be smarter about it, no matter what age it is. So with that, within the sisterhood and the tent of it, um, <laughs> Kaneda, given where you are at in terms of building your business and how you went from South Korea to the CEO of your business, could you share a little bit about what you think of as financial planning and why it is so critical, especially to women? And I love that you started the conversation with your true story, right? And, and many of us wouldn't have created that story in our wildest dreams, but it's very honest and very true for many of us. So it's a little bit about my background. My parents didn't invest well. They had a 401k. They just put money in the 401k, really weren't aware of what funds or options were available to them. And they had a pension, which is now very few and far between. So they retired comfortably, whereas most of us will not have a pension. Um, so going to Smith, having the opportunity to have fantastic friends from all walks of life, I learned about um, investing in capital group from an alum. And that really changed what I thought about not only my personal money management, but how was I impacting how my family other community members, and then also my Smithies about their financial plans and what they should be thinking about. So when you kind of sit back and think of your life stage, you're graduating from Smith, you're a you know 20 something year old, you're, you have an amazing offer, let's just start there. Um, I realized we didn't know what questions to ask. Was the offer competitive, right? Could you advocate for a different type of package that was better for you? And at that point, I, I realized there was a lot of work to do with just breaking down the barrier that you have to talk to your parents' advisor, if they had one, <laughs> and or you were too young to have someone to talk with. So when I started my, um, well, before I started my firm, I was with another firm, but I was really interested in talking to young professionals and then also not assuming that only young professionals didn't know what questions to ask. Uh, so as I, of course, when you're young, they say, you talk to the young people. <laughs> and then as I started asking questions, oh, my mother and father never mentioned that. So it really was eye-opening, and, and I uh, learned that planning was really important at every stage of your life, and it changes at every stage of your life. And as women, we forget that often there are roles that are given to us we don't necessarily ask for them or even we're not good at them in some cases, but they're given to us. So often that looks like caring for a family member or caring for an aging parent. So you not only have to figure out your needs, but someone else's as well. 
And I, I feel that as women, we want to think about how can we meet, make sure we're secure in our current plan, know that it will change, but have a partner to talk through that transition. So planning is, is essential and we're all planners. We had to figure out the subway, the train to get here, <laughs> what coats we were wearing, what shoes would allow us to walk with, you know, with that walk, you know, don't, don't mess with me. Mm -hmm. I'm going somewhere important, but I still look great. So all of that, <laughs> all of those are plans. So we're naturally, we're great at this, but sometimes it takes a text. What's the weather like? It, we need a friend. <laughs> we need to phone a friend. So I feel that the planning piece is, is something we all naturally are, are good at, but it just, we have to shift it. It's not just planning our arrival here on time. We're not. <laughs> um, but it's the arrival that we want to be intentional about. So I often talk to clients in all stages of life about where do you want to arrive and how can we be intentional about that arrival place? Um, and as women, you get calls from your parents and your friends that think you have it all together, but you always do. You don't always have it together, but you, you appreciate that by comment. But um, I found that um, being able to just say, let's figure it out um, was, was a great step in uh, being honest about where you are and uh, very clear and comfortable that you want a future destination, even if that destination isn't clear. Hopefully I answer the question. And um, but, the two different but, people can answer yeah. it in two different ways. Right. So Lisa, so, for you, can you what, the question? <laughs> right, yeah. I know. Part of what is to you financial planning, having done it for 20 years, mm -hmm. What have you learned in terms of how would you explain it to us? And why do you think it's particularly important to women, given your area of focus? Well, I think I also want to thank you for your authenticity. <laughs> um, and I want to thank Kanita, too, because I think everything I second everything she said. Um, and we we had our lunch and we were talking and, you know, I just want to I said to you and I said to everyone here, there is like no shame and embarrassment because I was in that same position when Bernstein hired me. I was like, I don't know why you want me. Like, I don't know anything about investing. I don't even know what's going on with my own money. And I'm not even really that interested in that. Um, <laughs> so it's, you know, I think a lot of us are extremely busy um, and overwhelmed dealing with all of the challenges of life. And at the time I was recruited by Bernstein from, I sold financial technology for 13 years. Um, I was in sort of an unhappy marriage, a long, an unhappy long-term marriage. I was the breadwinner. I had, you know, one kid in private school, you know, a deadbeat husband getting his like third graduate degree, uh, you know, a nanny, a, a kid, you know, and a baby. And I was like, you know, failure was really not an option, but I came here and I started, you know, I had an, they have an amazing training program here. And um, I realized, like, I'm starting to learn how to coach other people on planning and just, you know, common sense investment um, strategies. And like my own stuff is a mess and I don't even know where anything is. And, um, and then I went through a very messy and expensive divorce, which was, you know, financially devastating. And it really gave me insight into like what it must be like to go through that if you don't even have an income and how scary that must be and how many, um, how many women are in that position and they have amazing degrees from amazing schools. So um, I think, you know, one thing we talked about Katanjali is that when we're so overwhelmed and it's just like the idea of like, okay, I got the kids, I got the job, I got the income, I'll take care of the birthday parties and everything. Like you just like, all you have to do is like, take care of this. And, you know, fortunately, Gitanjali, I think is happily married and her, and her husband is, you know, a financial professional. So yes. he's got it. He's got it under control. Like my ex-husband wasn't even that. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> So he was not the person I should just be like handing my paycheck to every week. But I was just like so happy to delegate like anything to anyone. And believe me, he was like happy to for me to hand him that paycheck and just, you know, whatever he was doing with it. So, um, but um, so I think planning is like, you know, it's first of all, it's never too early to start. It's not rocket science. It's all about just, you know, 
coordinating your your financial resources, whether it's income or inheritance or whatever it might be, um, with where you are in your life. And um, it's overwhelming. I don't know if that was your next question, but yeah. it's overwhelming for, for everyone. And I can tell you, I, I, I speak to people who have tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. And when, you know, you try and get or started not. or not, or not. And, or, yeah. And, and the whole spectrum, but the point is even the people that have a huge amount of wealth and believe me, many of them are people in financial services, which I learned um, was a wake up call when I started building my practice. Um, you know, somebody may be a brilliant investment banker at Goldman Sachs, but when it comes to their, or a partner at a white shoe law firm, but when it comes to their own financial life, you know, they're, you know, like they wouldn't, they wouldn't, I would say you wouldn't perform your own root canal. You wouldn't, you know, remove your own kidney. So, but there's like this shame and like, oh yeah, I got this covered. I can do this myself. So um, it's really just, you know, it's it's overwhelming, but nobody knows what they spend. No, you know, very few people even really have a grasp on what they earn. And it's just like starting the process of, you know, we all, the biggest controls any of us have on our, on our financial life are, you know, what we're earning, you know, what we have, what we're earning and what we're spending. And, um, and it's helpful to have whatever, you know, they're all different kinds of financial planning, financial advisors, but someone who can just help guide you through that process. And even if it's just, you know, the general practitioner telling you like, yeah, you should exercise and you shouldn't smoke. It sometimes you just need someone who to tell you that because like you kind of <laughs> know it, but you need someone to kind of hold your feet to the fire. And Wonderful. that's a big part of, I think, what both of us do. Right. Awesome. So I'm going to pause here for a second. Um, if this has hopefully sparked questions that you want to ask and you want to think about things, we will take questions at the end. But in the interim, you'll have noted a pad and a pen on your chairs. Please feel free to jot down your questions and thoughts that come to mind. Christy and Kimberly will be there to gladly collect it from you and see where there are rep repeated questions so that it covers a scope of them. Uh, but also, this is not the only forum in which you get to ask questions. Christy will give you a little bit of a teaser on the app that Smith College has rolled out in ensuring that we can all stay connected um, and make sure that we can all reach each other. And those are two ways that you can reach out respectively to Lisa and Kaneda. So don't feel like you have to ask your question in open forum. There is also another one there. Okay. So with that, actually, Lisa, you touched on this. Um, if sensible educated women know that planning is a good thing and we naturally are planners, why does it feel so overwhelming when it comes to finances and personal finances? Um, well, the financial landscape has become much more complicated over time, but I felt like it was complicated even way back when, when I was getting started. So um, I've kind of grown with it. It's, it's amazing people's ability to like deny reality. So people don't want to face the reality of, you know, th that they're going to die, that, that someone else is going to die, that they may get fired one day, that they may have an unexpected emergency. Um, so, you know, I don't need to tell you this. Just like I said, you don't need a doctor to tell you it's not healthy to smoke. Burying your head in the sand is not a great strategy. Um, but I think, you know, we, I, I, I'm positive everyone in this room has a lot of stress in their life. Um, and we all know, like, dealing with it is a better, it, it's better for the stress level than just trying to, like, push it away. Um, so it's just, it, you know, it's, I, I, I deal with clients, it, it never, it never fails to amaze me who, you know, I have meetings with clients and who are in their 80s and 90s and, you know, they don't want to have a will and they don't want to talk about like, well, what do you, you know, you clearly you're not going to spend all your money. Like, what would you like, you know, would you rather 
you, know, you, you hate Trump, but do you want it to be up to, you know, the president? Like what happens to your money? Or, you know, I, I know you have issues with your children or you don't like what's happening with the organization you were going to leave your money to. But at the end of the day, wouldn't you rather dictate like what happens with your money than not? Or, you know, what happens? Who's going to take care of your kids if, God forbid, you you and your husband have a horrible accident and these are just like unpleasant things but it's you know i think we all know deep down or not so deep down that dealing with them is way better than not dealing with them and having a, a partner in whatever form of financial advisor you um, end up with who can just help you talk you through those things and then as i always say like the biggest really what my job is at the end of the day is taking emotion out of the process, mm -hmm. um, which is really hard to do when you're in the middle of it. And I think one of the reasons so many people in financial services are so bad at managing their own money is like they know like a little too much for their own good. So it's like the doctor who won't go for the colonoscopy because like they've seen how it plays out. So it's like they'd rather, they're just like, mm -hmm walking around with colon cancer because it's like, oh, well, I don't want to know. So, you know, just it's, you know, it's like it's better to know than not to know. And when you the more information you have, the more you can make rational decisions. Super. And I can attest to the fact that it does feel overwhelming and just getting started does help. And so, Kaneda, to you, when should you start this process and how do you take that first step? So I'm going to challenge the thought we might have about this answer. So I have a six and a seven-year-old, Madison and Bella, and we already talk about investing. We talk about budgets. We talk about how much we can afford. When we travel, we have a budget. And I didn't know this, that my daughter was listening. She told someone the other day, before we walk in a store, we know how much we're going to spend and we know how much is too much. <laughs> I'm thinking, I don't remember telling you that, but that's a great answer. <laughs> so I think it really starts, if we can, you know, influence the young person at that age. And I feel just to comment on the last question as well, it's overwhelming because we weren't really taught that very early. So I feel that if we can start earlier and talk to young people about just the basics, what's coming in, you have five rocks and you're skipping three, how many do you have left? just like your cash flow. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. So yep. if we're able to make it simple and not try to overcomplicate it, we'll do the next generation a world of good. So we talk to Bella and Maddie all the time. Mm, that toy broke two weeks after we had it. Is that a good company to buy? No, if I were CEO, I would have better quality control. <laughs> so, you know, making it simple. Um, is where we start. However, we're older than six and seven here. So if you were to think of the ideal time to start, by far, um, just as Lisa mentioned, the earlier the better. And it doesn't mean it has to be sophisticated as soon as you begin, but it's uh, what I heard someone say, max out your 401k. That's not easy to do right away, by the way. <laughs> yeah, so we're juggling different expenses, student loans, other things. So living in New York City, couldn't imagine it. But we have to also manage our other expenses. However, the earliest, the earlier, the better. And even if you think about what that means, it could mean an emergency fund. And then you graduate to your 401k or your Roth 401k. Mm -hmm. And then it's investing more in your HSA or progressively other, other options. But you don't know these acronyms. You're not the only one. Yeah. Yes. Health savings accounts. I'm glad I said that intentionally. I didn't explain it for a reason. So HSA, health savings accounts, um, which are for usually high deductible health insurance plans, but it's an investment option. So when you think about when to start, it's first digesting what you have access to. So most people think, oh, I, I'm going to open this outside account, but you've overlooked your match at work is better than just putting money in another environment or an account, excuse me, that won't match your, your contribution. The free money first. Free money first. If you're walking down the street, you wouldn't leave $20 bill on the floor, on the ground. So the match is first. So I really look at talking with clients about where you are today and 
if you are beyond the point where you're just starting to max out your 401k and you feel like it's too late, it's not too late either. There are so many options for you to just kind of organize things. Clean out the closet, look at those old accounts, those old logins, you have to reset the password <laughs> a couple of times. Get all of your information together. And some of you may have all of this organized, but it's just, well, what do I do now? So then at that point, it's just looking at what's the next step to make sure that your next goal, for example, is on track or figuring out who do you need to talk with to make sure that that next goal is on track. So I don't think there is an age answer. I feel that it's a stage. Are you ready to really take a look at what you have? And we all have something right? Whether it's your own independent business or an employer you're working with, you all have something. And I feel that the um, marketing information that you see on TV and other places may seem that uh, may streamline it into an employer benefit plan. But that's not the only place that you have access to begin a plan and in investing. Super. So I'm going to take you one other question before I want to ask you one, Lisa. Um, so Kaneda, you talk about having a goal. Mm -hmm. How do you define a goal? A goal could be, I want to be able to retire and have X amount to live on, or I want to be able to afford a little cottage by the sea or in Northampton. Um, <laughs> what is a goal? When you think, when you said goal, what does that mean for this group? And, and it could mean all of those things. Right? Yeah. Um, so for, for us, I, it's helpful when we talk with clients about stages, because sometimes we're just thinking about tomorrow. <laughs> Forget about 30 years from today. That's right. And if we're just talking about tomorrow, what's your goal for tomorrow? Make sure I can go to happy hour with my friends and not overspend. No, that's not a goal. That's just what I want, what Kanita wants yes. to hear. Yes. <laughs> no, so the idea is, what do you really want? Because it all is about trade-offs. So if the trade-off is not that important to you, then the goal um, isn't a, a crystallized dream. So when I think about a goal, it might be, um, affording a Smith education for my daughters. It could Definitely be mine. For kids. It's <laughs> right. true. Yeah. So it, it may be um, making sure I enjoy the journey. That's really, quite frankly, a very deep, important goal to me because we all have a great friend from Smith, save a lot, but you don't live enough. You live now. So I'm a huge fan of don't overlook enjoying your journey to your goal. And if the person you're working with isn't asking you about that, how are you enjoying life today? Then make sure you nudge and include that, that question into the conversation. But when you get the goal, you also have to know how to obtain it. So if it's, what are property taxes in Northampton right yeah, now? Yep. So, um, Zillow might be the easiest go-to, but what are maybe a, to duplex, a duplex? What, what does it cost to have a duplex in Northampton? And it's okay to dream. I find that at some stage in life, we're not encouraged to dream anymore. I spoke to a client a couple of weeks ago and I said, okay, let's plan this um, beach property. I heard you mention it a couple of times. And you know, Kenita, we've talked about it, but I've never thought we could actually do it. Of course you can. <laughs> but the idea is that if you just talk about it and uh, may not know the steps to get to that goal, then it really will just be a dream. So the goal has to be something you can hold on to and it's something important enough for you to sacrifice different things to save towards, or who knows, you may hit the lottery <laughs> and or have an inheritance, unexpected income. Yeah. But if you have the goal, you already know what you can contribute to, to help not only achieve what you need to do today, but also that other dream that you have um, down the line. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Lisa, how do you choose? a financial planner or a financial advisor, once you know your goal, or you may not need know your goal and you need the partner to work with you. Right. I'm gonna first um, tag on to something that Please. Kineda said, which I think ties into your question, mm -hmm. which is um, you know, about setting goals and enjoying the journey along the way and figuring out like how much is enough and what's really important to me. And um, my business partner, Haley, is, is sitting over there in my boss land. So one thing that, you know, I think we all undervalue is how important, like most of us, if, 
you know, if, if we're not lucky enough to just um, stumble into a lot of family wealth, like we're going to spend a lot, a lot of our life, the most, you know, most, m most of our time at work. And so it's really important to love what you do and love the people you work with. And um, so that's something I think, you know, there's a lot more talk in the recent, you know, recently just about like relationships and how that's like, how important that is to happiness. And Haley and I are on the phone every day with people of, you know, when someone says like, oh, I'm not, you know, I don't have enough money to invest with you. Or like, you know, I think I'm too big for you. Like, you never, like, people have no idea what, you know, some people are like, oh, I'm too small to be your client, I know, and they have, like, hundreds of millions of dollars, and some people are like, you know, well, if you don't have time for me, like, just say so, and they have, like, you know, $20, so, you know, I'll go, I'll take my money and go somewhere else, <laughs> and Haley and I spend a lot of time um, telling people, like, you can afford it, like, you have enough money, like, stop begging us and sending us thank you cards like every time you want to take some money out to go on vacation with your family like we tell you every time like you can afford it you have more money than you're ever going to spend your kids are fine you've maxed out all your philanthropic goals like please go and spend your money um so i think a big part of having a good financial advisor is someone who who know you feel like they know you and they know what your values are and they um, can kind of sometimes like represent your gut when you're not trusting your own gut about what you need well, to so. do. Um, and it's really, you know, I think we all, you know, especially, you know, we're educated women and, you know, 2023 and there's like, you know, so much headlines about, you know, the Madoffs and the taking advantage of people. And like, you know, we're, we're here to say like, we're not all bad guys. Many of us care very deeply about our clients and are here to do the right thing. You know, we're fiduciaries. We have a legal responsibility to act in your best interest, even if you don't like, you know, even if, but you have, at the end of the day, it, it boils down to like with everything important in life, it's about relationships. It's about like who you feel comfortable talking to. It's about what your gut is telling you. So there are many wonderful people in this industry and, you know, we're compensated different ways. But if, if you feel like someone's pushing you to do something you're not comfortable doing or they can't answer the questions that you're asking or, you know, it sounds too good to be true, it's like, it's okay to ask, you know, well, how does, like, how are you making money on that? If it's like, you know, it heads you win, tails you win, like, I'm not making anything. It's like, okay, well, you don't seem like you're here just like, you know, yep. as, as, as a charitable deed. So it's, you know, so it's just, it's like, it's again, it's like who you feel comfortable with and who you feel like you can talk to. And that's the most important thing in having someone who can be your partner and you know all your life stages and telling you like yeah like maybe you can afford this like house by the water and you know you if, if, if your priority is like you want to be able to afford to send your kids to smith like it's doable but it's like let's just figure out how to make it happen and maybe it means you have to cut back on something else and maybe you don't but um burying your head in the sand is never the right <laughs> the right strategy Super, thank you. And before we open it up to your questions, I wanted to ask both of you, Kaneda, starting with you, are there some popular myths that you'd like to bust for our Smith sisters here? For example, do we only need a financial planner when we hit that goal of 100 million or can we start with 100 bucks? So that first myth, Absolutely wrong. So you can start and you should start, not that you should, mm -hmm. but you want to start as early as possible. But I say don't overlook the resource again that you have access to. You're, if you're working for an employer, those reps, they're not always the most knowledgeable about everything, but they're a great place to start with your 401k. And some companies have planners that they um, provide in addition to just the investment um, relationship uh, manager, for example. So don't, for, don't be uncomfortable asking them questions. And if they explain it and you don't understand it, ask them to explain it again. And the, quite frankly, they may not know the real answer. 
So yes. I feel if you can't make something really simple, then they don't really understand it. So, and just that's okay. But you know now that you'll talk to someone else. So that's the myth number one. Um, myth number two, we often assume if someone dresses a certain way and speaks a certain way that they know what they're talking about, kind of talking about that same person. And they don't always. So training's different. Place. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes when you're talking to someone, you say, that just doesn't add up. It probably doesn't. <laughs> so it's okay to move on. But um, the myth that it's just so complicated, I guess I just can't understand it. You're a Smithies. You can understand it. Yep. But they're, you're challenging them to explain it in a better way than they have in the past. So the other piece I would say is um, a myth that I would say is more common um, lately is how should I navigate only passive investing or active investing? And I throw that term out there because it's something a lot of people worry about and are concerned about fees and things like that. Again, ask the question and try to make sure you're getting both sides of the answer, right? Someone who only loves active or mutual fund investing, someone who only likes passive ETFs, exchange traded funds, or individual securities. But you have to ask the question. And I love podcasts. So that's another way to start learning about um, different Great tip. options. Wonderful. <laughs> and um, I feel that those are kind of two big myths that I wanted to, to bust there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Lisa, do you have to have a will before you start planning? Yes. Everyone needs to have a will. Um, but you don't need one to start planning. No, you don't need one to start planning. Right. No, but particularly anyone, well, even if if you don't have any wealth or assets, but you have children, you need to have a will. Um, you don't want some court system deciding who's taking care of your kids. Um, if you have any assets, you want to have a will because you don't want some court system sucking up your all of your money mm -hmm. while people argue over who gets what. Um, and you should not do your will online on, you know, <laughs> lawyer.com or whatever. We have a wonderful trust in the states lawyer here. Um, and I'm sure Kanita and I know many wonderful trust in the states yes. lawyers, but Everyone, you know, pretty much everyone in this room should have a will, but you do not, you do not need to have a will to start planning for your financial future. Thank you. And with that, Christy and Kimberly, are there questions for the audience? Yes. <laughs> Don't we get to say what we're listening to? Sorry. Don't we get to say our favorite thing we're listening to? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So while we I, collected it, I'm sorry, we didn't, I didn't yeah. realize. That. While we're collecting this, but. Please. Uh, anyone who knows me knows I'm a big podcast person. Um, so I just want to share one that I really, really love. So I, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, and one of my favorites is um, Dan Harris, 10% Happier. And he did one recently on the psychology of money where he interviewed someone named Morgan Housel. Mm. And I would just encourage everyone to listen to it. Um, and I, I think if you haven't heard it, Kennedy, I think it would, it would, I think just in the short time I've known you, I think it would resonate with you, but it's, it really addresses the question of like, you know, there's such a thing as overthinking the whole investment decision. Mm -hmm. And there's like lots of great options and it's not rocket science. And it, you know, does it really matter whether you, you know, the most important thing is just like getting started, having a reasonable asset allocation, not spending more than you're earning. And really, most importantly, like having a concept of what what are your values and what's enough for you? Because it's very easy to just get caught up in this rat race of like whatever you have, there's just another thing you need to get and that then you're going to be happy. So I would recommend that. So Dan Harris. Dan, to know. Dan Harris, Morgan Housel. Interviewing Morgan Hassel. Super. And if Can anyone contacts me, I'll send them a link. Yeah. Yep. All right. We should have a resource share yeah. or something like that. <laughs> uh, because I, so I, again, six and seven year olds, so we're cello, we're at diving, we're at violin practice, and then we're going to school for, so busy, busy lives, right? So I'm an audible fan. fan. <laughs> so I'm listening to a book called Essentialism. 
and uh, I'm uh, actually a Smithy most, yes, yeah, Smithy started what, a book club and uh, I, that's how I read it. But it really kind of re, it's been uh, really helpful in this stage of life because it helps me prioritize. You know, I absolutely love talking to women about investing, young women. I love doing a lot of community work, but sometimes you always have to be, be able to touch what the priority is and evaluate your opportunities. So I've been enjoying that book quite a bit. Thank you. Essentialism. Essentialism. Mm -hmm. I'll have to look at the author. Okay, Christy, yeah. so we were just talking, well, all right. We were just talking about how to know kind of who to look for, right? So we just got a couple of recommendations. That was one of the questions was like, how do you discern when there's so many people out there who are gurus on social media? How do you know? And how do you know if someone's kind of that more creepy person you were mentioning before, Lisa, like the Bernie Madoff uh -huh. pushing product out there to get your money, not to really advise. How do you tell? What do you look for? I think a lot of it is, like I said, it's sort of this, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. And just ask the reasonable questions and like, okay, well, if it's guaranteed and blah, 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 like, why isn't everyone doing this? And if they can't answer the question, you know, that's a good wake up call. Um, I listened to another Dan Harris, 10% happier podcast today about, about, you know, can you really, what does it mean to trust your gut? And, you know, you, you have to, at some point, trust your instinct that if someone, if it doesn't feel right, it's probably not. And even if the person isn't a scumbag, if like, if you feel creepy when you're talking to them and they give you like, whatever, don't, don't talk to them. There's plenty of financial advisors out there. So you have to work. And then, you know, there's plenty of information online. See if someone has any complaints against them, if there's, mm -hmm. you know, but so if, you know, you do your research, but at the end of the day, there's, there's not one right answer and you need to trust someone and you need to get started. So you could spend, you know, we, we see people who spend their whole lives just like they're going to have one more meeting with you and one more interview and they just have one more question. And, you know, 20 years later, if they had just, you know, forget about me if, or Kanita, if they just put their money in the S&P, they would have like quadrupled their money. And now they're like exactly where they started because they don't trust anyone. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. segue into another question that we have by chance. Um, one of the questions is, I always thought that just putting your money in the market will yield better returns than using someone actively investing your money. Would you agree? Just one thing I'll add about um, what Lisa mentioned. Broker check is a pretty well-known um, option to, we all get grades, right? If someone complains <laughs> or we've done something wrong, there's ways to learn about that. And you should search, whether it's Google or broker check or another way, whoever you're working with. And um, that's important. And don't just work with someone because you know a family member or a friend that's working with them. I've heard that, well, this guy has a lot of money and he's in this, I'm like, okay. And then what happens? So I think it's really important not to trust someone else's gut. Yeah. <laughs> right. But, but yes. still yes. maybe value their insight, but trust your own is as important as well. So just <laughs> answering your question about and can I add to Canada, just so you know, something that Lisa and Canada both alluded to, financial advisors, financial planners are regulated people. They yeah. need to have licenses. They need to have uh, a regulator oversee their behavior. So when Canada was referring to broker check, there is a, an industry group, it's a self-regulatory organization called FINRA, F-I-N-R-A. If you just Google FINRA broker check, it will take you to that website. You can key in the person of uh, the name of this individual and it will yield their profile. So just wanted to debunk a little bit more of that. But to the question again, sorry, Christy, was? The question was about actively having someone manage an investor money versus just throwing it into the market and those are not contradictory terms, by the way. So, okay, tell us more. But you, you, sure. Uh, I would add, if you were to think your life savings, are you willing to just throw it in the market and see what happens? Pause. <laughs> <laughs> so I think at a stage, don't don't let. Sometimes we overthink a lot, right? Don't let the overthinking stop you from taking an action. Then yes, start there. But over time, as you're listening to podcasts, reading, trusted sources, um, you want to have a plan and a philosophy, a strategy about your investment. 
because it is serious. You know, it is a big decision. It's like, I just don't go to any college. I went to Smith College for these mm-hmm. reasons. Yeah. So it's just a very important decision. Um, and in the beginning, it is great to just start somewhere. But as you grow, as your accounts grow, as you have other goals that you want to achieve, it's really important to have um, a more comprehensive, full thought out allocation strategy, which just means where am I putting my money? Large companies, small companies, middle-sized companies, bonds, cash, U.S., non-U.S. So there's a few different options. And the U.S. isn't the only place. (laughs) That's another piece. Um, So I would say it's a bit more as your um, family grows, as your needs grow and change, you also want to have that in mind. And I'll just add, there's, you know, for, well, inside baseball talk, there's like a lot of debate in our industry about active management, which is a term, which is sort of the, the a form of investing where you're hiring a professional to pick stocks and um, versus passive, which is just tracking the index, like the S&P or the, the MS. CI world index or something. And it, it's really not that important which one, you know, we offer both here. And there is a very strong case to be made that in many cases, active managers who are picking stocks outperform over and certainly in certain market conditions in certain parts of the market versus just putting your money in an index fund. But that's not really the most important decision at all. The most important decision is investing period and and being diversified and whether you're full you know there are many wonderful financial advisors who um, can guide you on just having a diversified mix that's global and has different um, capitalization sizes and you can achieve that through low cost index funds at a discount brokerage shop or you can you can come to a Bernstein or a Newberg or Berman and have your portfolio fully actively managed. But having a financial advisor does not mean that you need to have active management right. yeah. in that way. Um, so it is, I think it is the most important thing is just having a plan and getting started. And over the long haul, we would all be better just, you know, not to oversimplify it, but if you are a long-term investor, yes, you should just put your money in the market and not think about it. It's like overthinking it is everyone's worst enemy, you know, trying to time it, trying to get out at the right time, trying to get in at the right time, just having a diversified mix and adding to it over time and staying invested is really what, what works best. Right. So last question We talked a little bit about free money earlier, which I love myself. And Smith College does a great job with matching and all of these things. What if you work for yourself? What do you, where do you find the free money? Where should you be looking? Great question. Are there other things you should have your eye on if you're self employed freelancer? A SEP IRA. Um, You know, there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of retirement tools for people that have their own businesses, you know, cash balance plans. um, individual 401ks, but anytime you have an uh, you have an ability to um, either contribute to a retirement account with pre-tax dollars, or even just even if it's after-tax dollars, a dollar invested in a retirement account is way more valuable than a dollar invested in a taxable account. So that's free money because if you're not being taxed on the so that's just you know the low hanging fruit that everyone should be taking advantage of. Five twenty nines if you're saving for college, HSAs if you have health expenses, and even just when you I say taxable accounts, that's just your cash account at your bank. Um, it can be a taxable account, like a brokerage account as well, where it's invested. But we forget the pennies that you're getting in your savings. It's a taxable account. So when we think about Um, just where we should put our money as far as business owners or non-business owners. Business owners have a great opportunity because now Secure Act 2.0, a regulation that um, was uh, recently enacted the end of December, allows those that may not have started a retirement plan at their, as they're the employer, different tax credits to get started. So there is a great opportunity to cover the cost of getting those 
plans up and running that were not available in the same way that they are now. The act changed a lot of other <coughs> in the retirement planning field. But as a business owner, you really have the authority to not only impact your saving for retirement, but your employers too, your employees too. So when you're thinking about a SEP or a simple IRA, Roth versus non-Roth or just pre-tax, don't forget that I work with 401k plans. Your employees want to save for themselves too, if you have employees. So if you're able to en enact a plan where you give a contribution, but they can also contribute on their own, that lets them move further along in the process as well. And before we wrap it up, I just wanted to say, having been on my own journey, it evolves. So don't think it's static. Don't think you have to come up with a plan to know now what you want 30 years from now, uh, because it changes. Right. Um, and you change, and your family needs change. So just know that you can keep moving with the flow. Mm -hmm. And with that, thank you. Thank you, Kaneda and thank Lisa. This has just been so tremendous. And handing over to Christy to tell us what to do next. First of all, I'm Christy Kennedy. I am a Smith alum, class of 2010, Albright House. I see a couple of you. Okay, great. Um, I'm also the director of alumni professional networks and career programs at our beloved alma mater, um, which has been lovely for me, um, mostly because I get to work with wonderful people like this. So let's hear it again for Kanita, Lisa, and Gitanjali. Thank you so much. So I work with the Smith Business Network, and as Sandy mentioned when she gave her opening remarks, that is all of you, right? That is the community, that is your network. So you've seen today what you can learn from three members of the Smith community. We want you to really tap into your network and leverage it for what you need. So you have folks in the room here tonight who are your local community here in New York City, but you can also find people right from your phone anywhere in the world. <laughs> Um, we've been living in this kind of in-person, hybrid, virtual space for three plus years now, um, and we've caught on at Smith, and now we have this wonderful app. So you'll see around the room, there are some stickers, there's QR codes, you can download the app. Um, it is the new and improved version of the Smith alum directory. Um, so it's your way to really search for people, find people you want to connect with, reach out to them. You can send them a direct message. Um, and I'd invite you all, if you have it, download it on your phone, or if you have a little bit of time to download it tonight, try it out. You meet someone in the room, you want to keep talking to our beloved panelists about all of this wisdom that they've shared. Find them in the app, send them a direct message, make that connection. We want you to be able to find who you need within your Smith network like you have here tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.